Hi everyone, welcome back to Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm your host, David Thompson. Today it's a true privilege to be joined by Martha Hotz, who is a professor of history at New York University and is the recent author of Morning Lincoln, which is now out with Yale University Press. So Dr. Hotz, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, if you don't mind, could you perhaps start us off with just a bit of a broad overview of what this book is about? Sure. Morning Lincoln is a book about personal responses to Lincoln's assassination. So what I wanted to do was move beyond the newspaper headlines, the sermons, the public rituals. Of course, I take all of that into account. But I found in looking through studies of the assassination that nobody had thought to read through all of the letters and diaries that people kept during this time. So I read hundreds and hundreds of letters, diaries, and other personal writings as well um, in order to get a sense of what the assassination meant to Northerners and Southerners, so that includes Union and Confederacy, men and women, as it turned out also children, soldiers and civilians, unknown, well-known, rich, poor, middling, uh, to see how people's personal responses differed from the public proclamations of a nation in mourning. Now, I'm sure this is a question that you get a lot uh, as you start to ramp up your publicity for this and you're talking with lots of different people, but what actually inspired you to tackle such a project about personal responses uh, to Lincoln's assassination? Well, you know, I've been teaching the Civil War for almost 25 years, and I always, in my lectures, mention, of course, the assassination, but I hadn't spent a lot of time on it. And I noticed that in recent years, I was spending more time on the assassination. And then when I was thinking about this book, I have traced back my interest in this book to my own experiences during 9-11. I was here in New York. It was the first day of the fall semester. I was about to head out to my class. Before I got downstairs in my West Village apartment building, the first plane had hit. I watched the second plane hit the towers, and then, and this is what in retrospect is so remarkable to me and what relates to my research about Lincoln's assassination, I continued on to class. The students arrived, sat in their chairs, and we began to over the syllabus. Everybody knew what had happened, but there was this sense of shock of not really grasping that the world had changed. And then eventually at some point, somebody opened the classroom door and said, you know, the towers have fallen down. And I said, okay, class dismissed. And then later that day, I remember I wrote my students an email saying I just didn't grasp the magnitude of what was happening. So that experience, and then also I have childhood memories of Kennedy's assassination. I was five years old. So that's quite vivid in my mind, although perhaps um, influenced by memory and by having seen on television over and over again or on YouTube, uh, the funeral, etc., but when I thought about these two events in my lifetime, and then I thought as a Civil War historian about the event at that moment that had affected historical actors in the most uh, phenomenal, momentous, catastrophic way, I realized how much I wanted to study what people did when they got the news, whether they were at home, in the street, uh, on their way to work, um, with their families, by themselves. That's the moment I wanted to study. Now, obviously, when you're tackling something like this and trying to get so many different personal responses, the, the source material is daunting. Um, for as much as we talk about how we wish that there were more voices around from the Civil War era that have written material down from some of the perhaps more downtrodden who, who couldn't share their experiences, there's still a lot of material out there. So I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about how you honed in on certain source, source material, kind of what did you consciously try to focus on, what did you consciously avoid, and as a result, kind of what were some of the benefits and uh, drawbacks, I guess, of those different types of source material? Well, the first thing I should say that is that I could research this book for the rest of my life. Everywhere I go, every time I talk about the book, I hear of a source that I didn't get to use. And I knew that was going to happen. So I read, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of sources. I stopped my research, not just in order to produce the book in a timely manner, although that was part of it, but also because I began to discern patterns. So the first thing I did, I would go to archives and I would look for material, any material, any personal papers from the spring and summer of 1865. 
whether they were soldiers or civilians or famous or not famous. That yielded both a lot of collections that I ended up sending back to the archivist because there was nothing relevant. Not that there was material from April 1865 in which people didn't mention Lincoln, because anyone who wrote during that time had something to say about the assassination. But it would be more if the month of April was missing or that people didn't write much over that summer. So one of the things I decided almost right away was I wanted this to be a study of real-time responses, the hours, days, weeks, and few months following. What that meant was that I rejected the use of memoirs. And I noticed that in history books, when people write about the assassination, they often rely on memoirs. They're some of the best sources, and they're some of the most vivid sources but they're also very obviously crafted and burnished and polished. And a few archives, a few collections I came across would have both an original document, like say a Civil War soldier's diary, and then a transcription that that soldier made later in his life. And the difference was really interesting. What might be one line in the diary would turn into a much longer description in the typed up copy that he had made, say in I don't know, 1905 or something like that. The other example, I think my favorite one, is that if you just read the memoirs, an impossible number of men carried Lincoln out of Ford's Theater that night. There just was not enough room around the body for that many people to carry him from Ford's Theater to Peterson House across the street. So some of those people weren't necessarily lying, but those were stories they had told themselves over the years. So the advantage was I was immersed in this moment um, the disadvantage was that there were certain voices that were missing, and key among those were African-American voices. Now, I did find diaries and letters, but not nearly the quantity that I found for white writers. So one of the things I did, because African-Americans are absolutely central to this story, um, I used letters that African-Americans had written to black newspapers, both Union soldiers and civilians. And they're not quite the same as personal letters, but they are personal communications, and the line between personal, private, public is, is very blurred in any case. People write personal letters with an eye toward other people reading them, and, uh, besides the person who it's meant for. People even write diary entries with an eye toward descendants reading them. So I wasn't disturbed by the fact that I was using published letters in order to understand African-American responses. Also, Frederick Douglass was a very important uh, source for me, although he didn't write personal he, just, he doesn't have personal papers that I was able to find. Um, he certainly wrote a great deal about Lincoln and the assassination. It was very important and is very important to my narrative. Now, did anything surprise you during this research process? I'm sure there are several things, but, but what out there really wouldn't necessarily shocked you, but what you found very fascinating over the course of this process? You know, one of the things I found so interesting, and I did not expect to find this when I went in at all because I wasn't looking for it, was the way everyday life, people's everyday lives persisted in the face of their responses to the assassination. So mourners would write, the world stopped, the world halted. Ministers also made that comment in their sermons, the entire world came to a halt. Um, at the same time, people wrote that in their diaries and no doubt felt that to be true. And I remember that feeling from 9-11. They would also write all kinds of things in letters and diaries, making very clear that the world hadn't stopped at all. So they were concerned about their farms, they were concerned about domestic labor, they were concerned about their children, they were concerned about uh, flirtation or romance, and without any compunction, people would intertwine their responses to Lincoln's assassination with the most mundane and often trivial events of everyday life. So when I began to read personal papers and personal responses, I realized that I needed not just to find the one line about Lincoln, but to find what people wrote before that line and after that line. And that really gave me a sense of how the day unfolded, how the week unfolded, and the fact that even though people clung to this idea that the entire world had come to a halt, they knew that wasn't true. Now, one of the, uh, well, I guess there are three individuals that are, uh, make a, an appearance at the beginning of, of every chapter, and that's Albert and uh, Sarah Brown 
as well as Rodney Dorman. And uh, to the Browns, obviously, are from the north, um, Salem, Massachusetts, originally. And then Rodney Dorman, although a northerner originally, uh, despite the fact, as you rightly, as you point out, which is I find very interesting, he claims he's from South Carolina by the 1860 census, uh, but he settles in Jacksonville, Florida, during the conflict. And these uh, individuals kind of feature as um, vignettes, opening vignettes for each of your chapters. And I wondered, I think it's probably readily apparent why you settled on them to some degree in the sense of the source material that's available with them, that it was so voluminous that um, you could track them over not necessarily the course of the entire war, but you could track them uh, certainly through the the portion that you're so interested in. But why did you, I guess, why did you settle on these three individuals? So first of all, you're absolutely right that um, their papers emerged in the course of my research because they were voluminous. So uh, Sarah and Albert Brown, the abolitionist couple from Salem, Massachusetts, they were separated during the war. Uh, Sarah was at home in Salem, and Albert was working for the Union Army and living on the Sea Islands of South Carolina. So they wrote long letters back and forth, all of which exist. And Sarah also kept a diary up in Salem, Massachusetts. So that was a wonderful resource. And Rodney Dorman, who was living in Union-occupied Jacksonville, um, an absolute rabid pro-slavery diehard rebel, kept the most extensive diary. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pages. So that was obviously one of the reasons. But in the course of my research, um, these three protagonists emerged as very interestingly illustrative of two ends of the ideological spectrum. So you have the New England abolitionists and you have the diehard rebel. And it really helps readers to understand the opposing stories um, and the opposing responses to Lincoln's assassination. And in a way, that's really the larger story of the book, the way in which personal responses to Lincoln's assassination illuminate the irreconcilable differences between Union and Confederacy when the war is over. And these, um, to, by structuring the book in the way I did, as you said, by opening each chapter with where the Browns and Rodney Dorman were, in relation to each particular theme of the chapter, it also gives the reader a story and a chronology to follow these characters through. And I found that for myself very helpful in structuring the book. Now, as someone just pops open the book and they look at the table of contents, they'll notice, obviously, and this is certainly purposeful on your part, that each chapter it settles around a theme. Some of them are emotions, others are not, but there's a clear theme, obviously, to each chapter. Uh, and it really uh, demonstrates the range of emotions, the range of thought that existed in the wake of Lincoln's assassination. So I wondered if you might take us through kind of a brief journey of some of these emotions uh, that you uh, discerned as that there is a pattern there during the course of your research, and, and that's how you base some of your work. Uh, and this also, thank you for that question, because this also relates to what surprised me. So I knew that the major reactions of Lincoln's mourners, his supporters, would be shock and grief. And I absolutely found that. Um, but I also found that Lincoln's mourners were really angry. They were infuriated when the assassination came to pass. And so that would be manifested in ways like uh, soldiers. Union soldiers would sit around the fire at camp and talk about all the violent, terrible things they wanted to do to John Wilkes Booth personally. Uh, a number, a surprising number of men made the point in letters and diaries that they personally wanted to have at John Wilkes Booth. Um, the other thing that, that Union soldiers expressed was they wanted there to be another battle. Now, obviously, Lincoln was assassinated five days after Lee surrendered. They wanted to go into battle and, in the words of a particular soldier, exterminate the Confederates. And actually, the word exterminate showed up numerous times. They were so infuriated. I also found that anger on the part of women. And that's a little bit less usual because anger was not an emotion that women were particularly supposed to have in the 19th century. Uh, so I found a wonderful example of a union supporting woman whose fiance was fighting for the Confederacy and she was all set to marry him after the war was over. And when Lincoln was assassinated, she wrote a letter to her mother saying not only was she breaking off the engagement, but that she hoped her fiance would be executed for treason. And she repeated it several times in the letter making clear what she was saying. So we're talking really phenomenal anger on the part of not only men, but also women. The other response that should not have surprised me and didn't in a general sense, but the, um, the depth of it 
I did find myself a bit taken aback was the utter glee that Confederates expressed when they heard the news of Lincoln's assassination. So they laughed, they clapped, they cheered. It was this phenomenal reprieve from defeat that had just come to pass. They thanked God, they uh, called Booth a hero. Even at, and this was the part that I found surprising, even at the same time as Confederates were saying, wow, this is scary because Lincoln would have been our best friend. So Confederates called Lincoln their best friend instantly. I thought that was something that had arisen over time, but that was an instant response. And then at the same time, they were absolutely gleeful at his assassination. And then the last thing I would say, and again, not particularly surprising, but the depth of hatred was surprising to me, and that was the Copperheads. The Copperheads in the North were, again, utterly gleeful. And that was not just civilians, but Union soldiers, some of whom were brought up on charges of treason as an accessory after the fact of the assassination. So what I found in the National Archives were these long trials of Union soldiers who had maligned Lincoln after he was assassinated. So whether they said something like, um, I'm glad the goddamn son of a bitch is dead, lots of that kind of language, uh, or they joked. One man said, well, Lincoln has as much brains now as he ever had. Of course, John Wilkes Booth has shot him in the head. Um, and these men were prosecuted, and therefore we have testimony about them, and we have their direct words. So the range of emotions was uh, deeper and in a way much more interesting and varied than I had imagined at first. And now finally, Dr. Hose, I'll leave you with this question. It's, I guess it's really the kind of bigger picture question. And, and the question is really, you know, what kind of larger narrative about American history is told um, and can be fleshed out, I guess, by examining these personal responses to the assassination? Wonderful question and very important to the book. In the end, after reading through hundreds and hundreds of responses, what came to be clear, or I shouldn't say in the end, all through the research, what became more and more clear was the clashing visions for the nation's future between Union and Confederate, between Lincoln supporters and his antagonists. Uh, so black Southerners and uh, black Southerners were on the same side, obviously, as uh, white Northerners um, and black Northerners. And then, of course, on the other side were the Confederates, and to some extent, the Copperheads were aligned with them. So uh, African Americans and their white allies, their vision of the future was a world of black freedom and beyond freedom, black equality. So they wanted land, they wanted education, uh, they wanted political rights, they wanted suffrage for black men, and they also wanted federal enforcement. Now, former Confederates, the vanquished Confederates, they wanted a world in which black subordination would be reinstated. Um, they wanted their own political rights and they wanted no federal oversight and no federal enforcement. Very, very different visions. Um, what was so interesting to me was that neither Union victory nor Lincoln's assassination subdued the Confederates. So while I was reading Confederate responses to the assassination, I would come across statements like, um, you know, we're going, to, we're, go we're going to have another war. It's not over yet. Um, even the line, the South will rise again, came up. Um, one young woman said something like, uh, we will try for our independence. We will try for a second war for independence. A young Confederate woman said that. And of course, that's what the Civil War had been for African Americans, since African Americans were not included in the ideals of the revolution. So through these responses, it became clear that this moment, this moment that in a way scholars have overlooked by glossing over with statements like the nation was in mourning, um, is such a window onto the irreconcilable differences that I mentioned earlier, the clashing visions of the nation's future. Um, at the end of the year, in December 1865, Frederick Douglass wrote down some thoughts about Lincoln, and he called the assassination an unspeakable calamity because he understood that what had happened had changed the future of the nation forever. And I should say, the last point I'll make is that African Americans and their more radical white allies, once Lincoln was a martyr, they reached back to him and crafted him in the most radical way possible. So when Frederick Douglass said, this is an unspeakable calamity, he was saying, along with many other African American petitioners, people who appealed to President Johnson, 
Lincoln would have treated us right. Lincoln would have done right by us. Black men would have the vote if Lincoln were alive. And of course that came to pass in radical reconstruction, but that was a matter of the radicals in Congress overriding President Johnson. So at the moment of presidential reconstruction in 1865 and 1866, there was a great deal of despair on the part of African Americans and their white allies. And there was a great deal of intention on the part of the vanquished Confederates to recreate the world that had been destroyed in the Civil War. Well, Dr. Hodes, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us today. Again, everyone, the book is Morning Lincoln, now out with Yale University Press. Um, truly wonderful insight into uh, personal responses and reactions uh, to Abraham Lincoln's assassination, as you rightly point out, uh, transcending so many different political uh, barriers uh, across North and South. And how you have individual, and how you really can't say that there are northern reactions and southern reactions. That there are so many different subgroups, and you really try and tackle as many as possible in a beautifully written book. And for any of you out there who have read uh, Dr. Hodes's other works, that should come as no surprise to you because she is a wonderful writer, uh, and you'll have a hard time putting this one down. So, Dr. Hodes, thank you so much for coming on, and hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Thank you so much, David. What a lovely interview. I really appreciate it.